wow. <laughs> and I don't know how much you're feeling it, folks, but this entire chancel is vibrating with sound right now. Tis a good thing. Well, welcome to Glebe St. James United Church on this April 9th, Holy Week's finale, if you will, Easter. My name is Reverend Dr. Teresa Burnett Cole, um, and I have the blessing of being the coordinating minister here at Glebe St. James, and I get to work with a fantastic group of people, both staff and volunteers. Glebe St. James is an affirming community of faith in the United Church of Canada, everyone, and their gender, race, ethnicity, abilities, and sexual orientation is welcome and celebrated in our worship. And if you don't experience that welcome, please let us know and we'll do better. We remember in gratitude the Algonquin peoples on whose traditional unceded land our sanctuary stands. We acknowledge their story and their stewardship of the land, water, plants, and animals through many generations. We honor their legacy by growing food and medicines in our garden, by working to make the space environmentally sustainable, and by supporting social justice issues, particularly those relating to indigenous people. So, thank you. In my language, I say na wen, miigwech. I will highlight four announcements this morning. First, there's going to be a celebration of ministries happening next Saturday at 11 o'clock at Rideau Park United, and our own Michelle Robichaud, uh, who was a candidate from St. Paul's Eastern, who we adopted, um, is being ordained, as well as uh, Dr. Junior Smith, uh, who will be um, joining us in ministry for a few months. Uh, he's going to be with us from May to August, and uh, you'll hear lots more about Junior. Both of these candidates wanted to um, encourage folks to come and join them in their celebration. Second, the Women's Intergenerational Group is meeting next Sunday after coffee time. The in-person meeting will be held uh, at noon in Fraser Hall. Bring your lunch and Marcia... Uh, emphasized your energy and great ideas, because um, the plan is to discuss how to move um, some of our anti-racism training ideas to action here at Glebe St. James. Third, at the annual congregational meeting, interest was expressed in further exploring Glebe St. James' annual indigenous land use fee. It's an amount of money we set aside um, and donate in recognition of the fact that we worship this sanctuary stands on unceded um, Algonquin land. There's going to be a broader discussion of um, that land use fee and also how we at Glebe St. James can deepen our relationships with First Nations in this area. And in, those whose territory we stand on, and also those indigenous organizations that are working within this territory. So, an ad hoc working group is being struck to explore these issues. Wendy Bergeron is the person organizing this, and if you're interested in participating, let her know by a week Monday. If you can't participate, but you've got some ideas that you want to share, rest assured there will be opportunities to do so. Last, but definitely not least, the GSJ Big Outdoor Bake Sale is back for a second year. If you recall last year, we were still on the edge of COVID and not sure what to do, so we held it outside. And it turns out people stop when they see things like that. So the sale is going to happen on Saturday, May 13th from noon till 10. So channel your inner baker. 
and donated items such as squares, loaves, cakes, bread, or pie. I added bread because there's never enough bread, and the bread is fabulous. If you can help out, let Susan Paul my know. Now obviously, you're, if you're here, you probably have a bulletin in your hand, but otherwise, the bulletin for today's service, for those listening with us online, can be found on the GSJ website. And on, a website, on the website, you can also find a link to this week's announcements and a donate button to make your offering. We try and make it as painless as possible. If you're here in person, there will be an opportunity to share your offering in the service. Now, if you out in TV land, um, like the early Christians are worshiping from home, take a moment and create a worship space around you. Light a candle, as we will be doing here in a moment. Quiet your mind and know that you are not alone. Now, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship on this Easter Sunday. Would you join me in our call to worship? What are you looking for? 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 Well, good news. Come in, love is alive. We gather as people who follow the light. Whether we wait for the sun. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Let us pray. Comforting God, on this Easter morning, we remember the discipleship of the women in the garden. We give thanks for their service to you and the astonishing news they shared. As you reassured them, chasing away their fear, dispelling their doubts and grief, share with us the wonder of your Easter hope. As you guided them with the teaching and ministry of Jesus the Christ, share with us the strength of this Easter faith. As you encourage them to affirm your living truth and to proclaim your risen triumph, inspire us to live out full of your Easter love and to proclaim your Easter promise. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Hallelujah, amen.
hey, James, that was pretty cool. <laughs> As a teenager, my younger brother used to yell down the stairs, Mom, I can't find my shoes. Sound familiar? My mother would lovingly holler back, Have you checked your closet? And my brother would assure her that he had and that they were nowhere to be found. And like walk, clockwork, my mom would walk up the creaky stairs of our two-story house and like some parental magic trick, pull my younger brother's shoes out of said closet. That has never happened to any parents in this room, has it? Yeah. The shoes were there the whole time. He just couldn't see them. Friends, sometimes our relationship with God can feel a little bit like that. We seek after God, we swear that's what we're looking for, and yet so often we miss when the divine is right under our noses. So let us pray together, knowing that our seeking has its limits, but God's love does not. Let us pray. God of the resurrection, we confess like a bog with a bone, we run endlessly. We chase our tails, looking for things that provide answers to the suffering of the world, looking for comfort to our own nights. You meet us in the darkness before dawn, but we mistake you for the gardener. Forgive us for seeking after worldly things. Forgive us for forgetting to seek you. Speak to us, call us by name, that we might recognize you in our midst. With hope and gratitude, we pray. Amen. Family of faith, no matter how many times we lose sight of God, God never loses sight of us. We might spend our whole days seeking, but we're always found. So hear and believe the good news of the gospel, the good news proclaimed in resurrection. What was once lost is found. We are held in God's loving image, forgiven, claimed, and sent to serve. Hallelujah. Amen. One of the great gifts that we have um, is our strong belief in peace. That's a peace that's beyond a cessation of war and hostility. We're talking about that deep peace from deep inside. Um, that's found when we're um, living life to the fullest and doing what we can for people in our community. And it's in that spirit of faith that I say to you, peace be with you. Let us offer one another a sign of peace.
Good morning, everyone. And happy Easter. Today we celebrate that Jesus has risen from the cross. Does, yes, I invite any of the children who are here with us this morning. If you'd like to gather closer, we can talk together, and then we'll go for Children's Church if you'd like to join us afterwards. So feel free to join us where there's room. And maybe while you're doing this, we could look around the church and see if we see the symbol of the cross anywhere. You might want some seats over here. Yeah, thanks for coming today. Hello. Morning. Hi. Yeah, so look around and see. Welcome. You can sit here if you like. There's some more space. You want to sit there? And there's more kids. Would you like to sit here? So take a look around. See if anyone can point out some crosses in our church. You see one? There's one up on the wall, a nice big wooden one. There's one, which one are you pointing to? On the banner? Yes, that's a beautiful one that somebody made. There's a gold one at the front. Yeah, so, oh, do you see another one? On the candle, that's right. That's a tricky one to see. You have good eyes. Mm -hmm. So if we keep our eyes open today, we might see the cross around us. And why do we use the cross as a symbol? Anyone know? Why does this symbol remind us of Jesus? What do you, what do you think? Because he, yes, Jesus was put on the cross and he suffered but he didn't stay there. He rose again. Do you have some other ideas? Because he got killed there? Yes, he did die there, yes. And people put him there, so he wasn't cheated very well. But we know that he didn't stay there. And so we celebrate today. And another reason that a cross is helpful for us to remember is because there's an up and down part of the cross, the vertical part. And that helps us remember to join God above us and the earth. And Jesus can be in the middle. And there's also the cross part that reminds us that we are all connected. And that's why we're all here today, to remember about Jesus' life. Now last week, we were shouting out, does anyone remember what word we were shouting last week? Hosanna! We were shouting out Hosanna. And who remembers what that means? Help us. Help us, save us, because people were looking for somebody to come help them. And then, as Jesus was coming in to town, riding on a donkey, people started to realize, oh, this is the person God sent to save us. And that meaning of Hosanna kind of changed a little bit on that day. And now we especially shout, what word do we shout now? Hallelujah. hallelujah, just like we were singing. Yeah, so we can say hallelujah, and what do you think hallelujah means? Rejoice, yeah, yeah, rejoice. What do you guys think hallelujah means? Um, kindness. kindness, yeah, and thank you, and praise God. Yeah, <laughs> it's a nice word. It sounds good when you say it. Do you want to shout it out again? Hallelujah! <laughs> so what can we, why would we be praising God? What are we thankful for? Kids. Kids, yes! Hallelujah for kids! What else? What are you thankful for? Are you thankful for anything? Yeah? Yeah? What are you thankful for? Your mom? Maybe some chocolate today? You never know what might show up for Easter. Yeah. I'm thankful personally for heat and for electricity and the internet because I didn't have any for a few days. What else? <laughs> Something else? Especially on Easter Sunday, what might we be thankful for? What are you thankful for? Um, um, 
Earth, the earth, yeah. The earth is very special and it's a great gift from God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so today we celebrate especially that Jesus came. And Jesus came to save us. And there's lots we can learn and celebrate about Jesus' life. And that's what we're celebrating today. So let's just take a moment and we can pray together. You can repeat after me. Holy One. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for sending Jesus. Jesus. We are grateful for his life life. and continue to learn from his teachings. teachings. Amen. Amen. Okay, so I invite any children who are with us today to come join us. And we're going to do a special activity together and we'll come back for communion. And then you can rejoin your parents after if you like. So please feel free to join us. Yes, we'll come on. That was a massive exodus. <laughs> Blessings on the Adolf volunteers and Susan. It's times like that I'm really grateful to be standing here. <laughs> Let us pray. Rabboni, teacher, we have spent the past six weeks asking questions. We have turned over every rock. We have shined a light in every dusty corner. We've opened the blinds, we've wrestled with truth, and we have sought you. So on this Easter morning, bring wisdom to our seeking. Move through this room until the walls echo with the sounds of hallelujah. Roll back the stones that might prevent us from drawing close to you. Calm our hearts, say our names, awaken us to your presence in our midst. We are here, we're listening, and we're seeking after you. Alleluia. Amen. Our reading this morning is from John, uh, from John chapter 20, beginning with verse 1. Early in the morning on the first day of the week, While it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone was moved away from the entrance. She ran at once to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, gasping for breath. They took the master from the tomb. We don't know where they've put him. Peter and the other disciple left immediately for the tomb. They ran neck and neck. The other disciple got to the tomb first, outrunning Peter. Stooping to look in, he saw the pieces of linen cloth lying there, but he didn't go in. Simon Peter arrived after him, entered the tomb, observed the linen cloths lying there, and the kerchief used to cover his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but separate, neatly folded by itself. Then the other disciple, the one who had gotten there first, went into the tomb, took one look at the evidence, and believed. No one yet knew from the scripture that he had to rise from the dead. The disciples then went back home. But Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. As she wept, she knelt to look into the tomb and saw two angels sitting there, dressed in white, one at the head, the other at the foot of where Jesus' body had laid. They said to her, Woman, why do you weep? They took my master, she said and I don't know where they put him. After she said this, she turned away and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't recognize him. Jesus spoke to her, Woman, why do you weep? Who are you looking for? She, thinking that he was the gardener, said, Sir, if you took him, tell me where you put him so I can care for him. Jesus said, Mary? Turning to face him, she said in Hebrew, Rabboni, meaning teacher. 
Jesus said, Don't cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go to my brothers and tell them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went, telling the news to the disciples. I saw the Master, and she told them everything he said to her. This is wisdom from our ancestors in faith.
Easter is one of those occasions on which most folks who come to church already know the story. Due to their familiarity with the Easter narratives, some in our number might be tempted to let their minds wander during the reading of scripture, or maybe the sermon. There is certainly no shortage of other matters competing for our attention on Easter morning. Congregants and friends we haven't seen in ages, the amazing music, a brass instrument or two. Uh, I'm kind of distracted by the timpani because they're my favorite. <laughs> and, you know, for, for those who are hosting Easter dinner, there's that little matter of the preparation of the Easter dinner. And Lord forbid the ham or the turkey. Still, as Christians, we ought not to underestimate the power of scripture, the power of story, no matter how familiar it might be. This morning, we heard the resurrection account from John's Gospel. Now, this story deserves a close look, precisely because we are so familiar with it that we often hear what we think we know. Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb and sees that the stone has been rolled away. With the news that the Lord's body is gone, she runs to Peter and John, or uh, as he's called, the disciple whom Jesus loved deciding that they need to see it for themselves, these two disciples run to the tomb and find it empty, just as Mary said they would. The linen wrappings are lying there right inside, but there's no body to be found. Now, one thing we might miss because of our previous experience with this passage is that Mary Magdalene, Peter, and John have, a, have very different reactions to the empty tomb. John, the text tells us, saw and believed as soon as he entered the tomb. Until that point, the disciples had not yet understood what had been told to them, that Jesus must rise from the dead. Now, apparently, this is when it clicks in for John, right as it's unfolding before his eyes. As for Peter, well, the scripture isn't as explicit. Maybe he gets it, maybe he doesn't. It would seem as though he has some more thinking to do. And he and John both returned home. Mary, on the other hand, doesn't seem to get it at all. At least not yet. And can she be expected to amid the shock of these pre-dawn hours? It's no wonder she remains at the tomb to weep. Thinking his body has been carried away, she's left to lament that she's lost Jesus a second time. It can be tempting for us to try to identify with the major players in this or any of our more familiar scriptures in search of a way to connect um, at a deeper level with prominent biblical f uh, figures. We might find ourselves wanting to determine which ones we are most similar to and why. You know, this is the sort of thing we do when we ask ourselves, am I a Mary or a Martha? Upon hearing the familiar account of Jesus visiting the sister's home in Bethany. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with the desire to relate to a particular individual in this or any biblical passage. But by doing so, we may run the risk of limiting our perspective when instead we're called to expand it. Perhaps in this case, by finding points of connection with several of the people we encounter. Take, for example, the three disciples we meet, met today. Are they not each of us, uh, are we not each of us, some combination of John, Peter, and Mary Magdalene? It might depend on the season of our life or our time and location along the path of our Christian journey. We are John when we see something and believe it. We are John when the object of our heart's desire dawns on us in real time, when the realization of it causes all the puzzle pieces to fall into place. You know that aha moment? Yeah. We are John when we arrive on Easter morning without one shadow of a doubt that Jesus is risen. There was a woman who not too terribly long ago sat alone at a hospice bed 
where her husband of 61 years lay dead. It had only been a few minutes since his passing when the chaplain walked in to see her, but before he could speak, she put her hands up quietly and gently shook her head. I know where my husband is, she said sternly. If you want to find someone who needs convincing, you'll have to go someplace else. We are John when we rest certain and secure in our faith. We are Peter when we're not quite as certain. Peter, when it takes just a little longer to sort it all out. I have days when I completely channel Peter. The story is told of a young girl, maybe three or four years old, who went to Sunday school and to church with her grandmother one Easter morning. On the way, her grandmother explained the story of Jesus' resurrection, including his death on Good Friday. Then early on Sunday morning, she said, he came back to life, and the little girl stared up at her with a look teetering on the soft edge of innocence and confusion and replied, yeah, right. <laughs> Apparently, she needed a little bit more time to think it over. And we are merry when our grief overcomes our ability to make sense of the mystery of eternal life. We are merry when a loved one dies and our grief overwhelms our other senses. And from time to time, and for good reason, we all lose the ability to perceive something that is right in front of us, even if that something is the presence of God. We find ourselves, each of us, in different places on our Christian journey at different times. And that's just fine, even on Easter. You might well be able to run toward the empty tomb with an undefended heart predisposed to believe even before you get a look at the evidence. Or perhaps once you arrive, you need to turn away in confusion. You might simply need to take some time to sort out what's happened and then come back later. That would be fine too. God knows that there are those of us who will need just a little bit more time to hang around outside and maybe have a good cry. None of our possible responses changes the truth of the matter that whoever you are, wherever you are, Jesus is right there by your side. You may not always perceive him. He is there nonetheless. He's waiting to say your name. And even when you least expect it, to remind you of the faith that you have deep inside. That faith can only be instilled by the one through whom all things are made. That faith is all that is necessary to go out and proclaim the one who lives. Thanks be to God.
I don't know about you, but I didn't really know that last hymn. But it is the only hymn in our hymn book that talks about the particular gospel story that we listen to today. So I thought it would be good to dust it off and give it a try. As our loving teacher, Jesus teaches us to reach out and to help through all the troubles of life in loving ways, let us reach out to each other and to others in our community in the wor- and in the world as we present our offerings this morning. Sometimes we just don't think about what we give, O oh God, because we just do it. We set up pars so that each month our donation automatically comes out. We go online and donate electronically, or we mail in a check or drop it in the offering plate. Yet every donation of our time, our talent, and our treasure, however offered, becomes part of the tapestry of our calling to serve in the world. Bless what we give, we pray, no matter how we give, as our joyful answer to your call to reach out in love to the world. Amen. Please be seated. Thanks, big guy.
Friends, it would have been as easy on that Easter morning for Jesus to roll away the stone, to walk to the city center and just stand there and declare that death had not won. Instead, Jesus waited in the garden. He waited for the people who needed him most. He waited for Mary. He called her by name. He stopped her crying. He gave her a reason to hope. So if you've ever doubted that God's love is for you is personal and specific, may this truth of this day remind you otherwise. The God you seek will meet you in the garden on your hardest days. And that same God has a seat saved at this table specifically for you. So come. Come whether you're dancing for joy or like Mary, feeling a little lost. Come with your questions. Come with your hunger. Come whether this is your first time here or your hundredth. Come because this feast is a reminder that God's table is big, big enough for all of us. Jesus Christ is risen today and he rose for each one of us. So welcome and do feel welcome. This is not the table of the uh, United Church of Canada. It isn't even Glebe St. James' table. This is the dining table of Jesus Christ and you are welcome here. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God. Let us pray. Resurrecting God, Mary went to the garden looking for you. 2,000 years later, we follow in her footsteps. We seek after you, hungry for a garden moment where we might hear you say our name or feel you in our midst. So before the hallelujahs begin, we empty our pockets of our prayers and remember where we've been. With gratitude, we recall Monday Thursday and we're grateful for the tables we gather around, for the friends that feel like family and for this church, which acts as our band of disciples. We hold on to the reminder of you washing the disciples' feet that night and trust that that same love extends to us. With sorrow, we recall Good Friday. We grieve the depths of cruelty woven into that day, a cruelty so many in this hurting world know. So, for those whose days have turned to night, relieve them of their suffering, find them in the crowd, wipe their tears, hold their grief for them, and point them toward peace. Now with hope we enter into this Easter morning to find ourselves face to face with your good news. Thank you for giving us reason to hope. Thank you for the sunrise after a long night, for bright sun after snow and ice, for the healing of bones and hearts, for laughter that is contagious, and for the joy felt in community. Tether every gratitude and joy in our life back to you as we sing. And now, as we come to the table, just as Mary came to the tomb, we ask that in every stage of our seeking, 
you would be near us. Pour us a double portion of your spirit and pour out that spirit on this bread and cup that we might see you as clearly as Mary did. May this meal nourish us to build your kingdom here. Until that promised day, we pray the words you taught us to pray, saying, Our Mother and Father, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And as we wait and watch for your coming among us, we proclaim your goodness. At this time, we also remember all with whom you would have us share your feast. We pray for all who are in sorrow or pain, all who are ill or alone, all who are close to our hearts, all our brothers and sisters who live with fear, oppression, or hunger, all those whose lives have been blighted by violence, racism, or poverty, for all whom the world counts as last and least. We pray for the church and its many ministries, for nations as they strive for peace and justice, and for an end to all violence, including violence against women. God of hope, make this bread the means of our rebuilding, this wine the medium of our transformation, this table the foundation of our renewal, and this community the place of our rebirth. At this time we remember Jesus, who on the night before he died, took a loaf of bread, gave you thanks, and broke it, saying, take and eat. Whenever you do this, remember me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant. Whenever you drink, remember me. Gracious God, breath of peace, source of love, we pray for your spirit. Make us one, make us though broken whole, make us despite but alive. And so we pray. And so we sing. The body of Christ, the lifeblood of Christ. Let us eat and drink together for our strengthening in the faith and for the sake of the world. Here's why I channel my inner stewardess. Um, just to give you an explanation of how we're going to do this thing. I'm going to ask for the communion servers and the healing pathway uh, folks to come forward first so they can get themselves organized and uh, prepared. Um, then we're going to come up the center aisle, up to the front, and around through the uh, 
side aisles. This will work. I trust me. If if you um, have difficulty moving and would prefer to have someone come to you, just raise your hand and we'll be happy to do that. Now, this morning we are having healing prayer with our communion. This was our practice um, for years pre-COVID. Uh, and so this is reintroducing our healing uh, pathway prayer. Um, it's a touchless prayer. So if you would like folks to pray for you, um, just wait in the chair and they will pray over you specifically for your needs. And then you can wander back to your pew. You don't have to do it, um, but it is a holy moment. I'm just checking, I haven't forgotten anything. No, we're good. So can I have the communion servers and the Healing Pathways folks come forward? Bless your ministry. And just to assure you, communion is uh, done with small cups, so there's no common cup, and the bread is served to you uh, with tongs, because we're aware um, of the major challenges we face in this COVID uh, era.
I love the fact that we have uh, the ability to call on folks in the congregation to serve. And if you hadn't noticed, they serve themselves last. And I always think of that as kind of a mother thing to do, right? When she feeds her kids, she makes sure everybody has enough. And if she doesn't, she skips a little, right? And uh, I like that image of being um, a mother in God. Would you join me in our prayer after communion? There we are. Where don't we seek after you, God? We look for you in the mirrors, in strangers, in sunrises, among the lumps, in the laughter of children, and in the meals shared together. We look for you on city streets, in hospital rooms, in jail cells, in poetry and hymn melodies. We look for you everywhere. Sometimes the seeking is hard, but at other times, we come to this table and all are fed, all are welcomed, and there is room for everyone and no one is turned away or made to feel unworthy. And in those moments, we seek you clearly. So thank you for meeting us in our seeking. Please don't stop seeking us. Gratefully, we pray. Amen.
I think I want you guys to come and play every week. <laughs> oh my goodness, what a privilege for us to celebrate like this today. Uh, I have the very great honor to thank a number of people, and I'd like to start in honor of Teresa's percussionist uh, bent with our percussionist up here. <laughs> thank you so much. And <laughs> yes. And the brass, oh my goodness, isn't that Easter for us? Thank you. Wow. It takes a village to make this kind of week of services work. Um, there have been so many services, and this is the culmination. So I want to thank, first of all, I want to thank James for your musical vision. And I think he's waving at me to stop thanking him because he is a bit shy. But his gifts of conducting as a choir member, it's uh, remarkable to be a part of this choir. We are very fortunate to have a few stringers along this week. Thank you for the extra voices. It's made us uh, feel a lot more confident. But you can't imagine what it's like to sing in this place, sing out your biggest voice. It's the most extraordinary thing on Easter. So um, I also want to thank, of course, Teresa for your vision for worship that brings us to new places and new understanding and recognition. This today was extraordinary and a real culmination of a very special Holy Week. I have to say I have to thank Liz Elton. <laughs> <laughs> as long as I've been in the choir, Liz has been the marshal. And, and to Dudley's point about, um, what is it, Myers-Briggs, uh, there is a character in Myers-Briggs which is called the marshal. And I don't know Liz's Myers-Briggs, but you've got to be the marshal. Because she keeps us in line in the most tactful and discreet way, but man, there is no bro broking her, uh, her honor, my God. I also want you to understand that this is the first Sunday in 20, 20 plus years that our other choir loft is being used. So thanks to Liz and Liz Caswell and Liz Elton and Angus who put the floor down up there, took the, took the old organ out, put the floor down, so that we could actually use that space. Uh, I also, every year, the person that quietly comes in and changes all these magnificent banners, that's Judy Wilensky. Thank you, Judy. And she never wants anybody to know that she does it, but she does it every time. It's amazing. Um, Shelley, who couldn't be here, usually manages uh, the communion. She also managed Maundy Thursday and Good Friday services. We also have, of course, the ushers and the counters and the coffee hour worker bees. We've got Marion Dunning, who stepped in very quickly to, to help out because Shelley wasn't here. And all the Healing Pathways uh, people, that's such important work. The AV team, oh my goodness, our AV team. They've captured all our services through the year and sometimes the internet is unstable and you'd be watching it and suddenly it goes and it's like beyond their capacity. But eventually the services get posted on YouTube and thanks to Crystal and Jim for managing our website on the YouTube. Um, also, the sextants who open the church and look after it when we're gone. And the person who is not here but always needs thanks is our other marshal, Jennifer Reed. She stick handles our church administration with Daniel Alfredson and Eric Carlson's skill, manages us all, keeps us in line very discreetly. Thank you. Happy Easter, everyone.
And thank you to Pam, who took on the job uh, just a few weeks ago of chairing the church council. You and me are going to work together, girl. <laughs> My friends, as you leave this place, may God bless you with seeking. Seek out the hungry. Seek the weary. Seek the good in every person you pass. Seek the hopeful. Seek the faithful. Seek God in each of us. And as you seek, and as you wander, wonder, may you find what you're looking for. And remember, if you're going to take away one thing from this service, remember this. You are never alone. For you go with God, the source of love, Jesus, the love in human form, and the Holy Spirit, love's promise and power. So let us sing. <laughs>